Are you guys comfortable? Yes? Screw that. I don't want you to be comfortable. Put everything down, all your phones, all your computers, all your bags on the floor. Stop looking at your iPhone, stop looking at your books, whatever, and let's stand up. It's 3.30, uh, uh, the question is, I think pretty big, uh, scary one also. So I also ask my panel to stand up in, uh, in solidarity. So I am a very, very strong believer in conscious doing and everything for me results in action. And I'm also a very, very strong believer of conscious intentions. If the intentions come from the deepest, most intimate, sacred place in each one of you that could shake the grounds of this We, Fe we Share Festival and the grounds of Paris, whatever change you want to do, whatever reason you are here standing, or whatever reason these guys are here standing, you will do it, you will change. But the question is about intention. So, the room looks quite good, quite full. There's a lot of people outside. So let's see if we can get our intention heard as far and wide into the circus and see how far it will go. It's just a small challenge that we, a group of uh, enthusiastic, let's call it change makers, collaborative change makers, to correct it, and let's try a power posture. Who knows what is a power posture? Just to wake everyone up, perfect. A power posture is something that boosts this level of intention and boosts this level of confidence, whatever it is, and gives an open energy into the room and into yourself, okay? So we're going to pick a word. I thought the easiest word is going to be change. Agree? Yes? No? We can also pick hello. Change? Okay, change. Yes? So on the count of three, one, not yet. So on the count of three, everybody will do this power posture. And from the deepest part of you, the sacred most part of you, you are going to intentionally call out for change. Change that is going to shake the grounds of we share. Yes? Let's try. Okay? So now count. One, two, three. Change! Wow. That's, uh, I didn't expect that. But... I don't know. Was it like in a half a sacred place, maybe? I don't know. Should we try one more time? Just one more time? Just wake us up, okay? I won't do it this time. I'll just watch you guys. It's so amazing. And can we take a picture? I'm sorry. I have to take a picture of this. It's so cool. <laughs> I have to show it to my mom. She always laughs at me when I talk about collaboration because she lives in India and they do it every day. Okay. So, okay. So, at the count of three. One, two... Three! Change! Oh my god, yes, we shook. Big applause, everyone. Thank you so much. Can you just wait one second? The change, the big bang, I'm already seeing a lot of faces come in. They're like, what's happening? Um, comes from the big bang, but there's also the convergence the space, the center that everybody has. And that is why we are here to listen to these amazing panel of speakers. And this space is very important to have an open discussion. And since I said I'm a very big fan of conscious doing, the point of this panel is to collect examples, real life walking, talking examples of people already doing what the question is talking about. It's not just a pseudo question. And we're not here to come and solve or uh, change or reinvent the wheel. We're not doing that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to gather all these examples, what these guys are going to also point out. And I have a few. I will put it on a sheet of paper and I will stick it somewhere in uh, we share. And you guys go find a conversation, find out what's happening, and go replicate it in your countries, your cities, whatever. So it's conscious doing, all right? So let's start the panel by maybe a conscious intention. Okay, so it's very simple exercise. We will invest a little bit of our, our time before starting to talk and exchange ideas on consciousness. And one thing is like to dedicate it some time to silence and to silence our minds. So I brought this Tibetan bell. I will ring it twice. First time, 
It's just for us to relax, so please start to feel relaxed in your chairs. I preferably like to close my eyes, but if you don't like it, you can be with the eyes open. But just relax now. And first ring is for us to start stop thinking or trying to stop thinking because there are so many things in our minds. And the second ring, then we come back to the thinking. Okay, so let's start. Perfect, thank you. So let's get our minds rolling again. We have such a big topic here. I think for the convenience of everybody in the crowd, I took the liberty to define poverty. I'm gonna win the Nobel Prize for this, no. I just took Wikipedia. So since we're talking about the developing world and the developed world, I want to keep the topic as possible in this definition of poverty uh, as possible. So absolute poverty, refers to the deprivation of basic human needs, which commonly includes food, water, sanitation, clothing, shelter, and healthcare, which is mostly the case in developing countries and underdeveloped countries. And relative poverty, which according to an economic per, uh, point of view, which is true for uh, most of the developed countries, is economic in inequality, where the deprivation is about consumption, about income inequality, and economic inequality. But I also see it as a deprivation of purpose, about not belonging in a community, about not knowing where we're headed, is also for me a kind of relative poverty. So I told you it's gonna be an active session, so you can't just sit and relax, that doesn't work. Um, so I'm gonna do a small poll here to just get an understanding of you guys and the panel. So if you've lived more than a year in whatever you think is a developing or an underdeveloped country, I would like, or if you're a resident of that country, I would like us to stand up. Yes? A developing or uh, underdeveloped country, if you've either lived there for more than a year, about a year, that's quiet. That's great. Thank you very much. Sit down. Now, people from so called the developed world either living there or have lived more than a year or so there, would like to stand up. Thank you very much. So, I will hit right to the dot and I will repeat the question, could the collaborative economy help address poverty and exclusion in both developed and developing countries? I just want either a yes Either or no, either or gray. So, who wants to start? Just yes or no, just the poll. I am sure. Perfect. I'd go for gray. Gray? Yeah. Gray, okay. I go for yes. 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 So, three yeses. So, it's possible. When me and uh, Thomas, we were exchanging emails, we were talking about the human aspect about this, about the panel. The big elephant in the room, we all are quite obviously, we know about, which we will just probably repeat. He wrote, quote, maybe a money-driven entrepreneurial culture being the sharing economy's greatest opportunity of scaling and returning investments as it is in the tech industry, maybe a blessing, a big one, or maybe also a contrary. So I want to ask you, Thomas, how much of this do you think it's true and 
Why do you think the human aspect of answering this question, the entrepreneurial aspect of this question, because there are so many brilliant minds out here, how does this affect it? Yeah. So I just answered, uh, I'm sure that it can address poverty, but the, the, the thing is that we are not doing yet properly. And the real truth is there are very few cases talking about and doing things to address poverty directly. So the idea that I talked before on conscious business, uh, and I wrote in the email to Narmada, is that, come on, let's think. Uh, the collaborative economy, it's scaling a lot because the transactional costs of each and every interaction, uh, collaboration, accessing to cars, apartments, bikes, whatever, it's very fast. And technology, that came from 2009 and scaled till now, 2015, it really enables a really big type of ecosystem of collaborative economy. The problem that we are all talking in several different workshops and talks here is that money is a very powerful energy. Sometimes doesn't come with a conscious, doesn't come with a true intention of delivering more value to society. Because the venture capitals that we know that are really, really interested in return over investment, the ROI, they are getting this platform, they are scaling them very fast. And in this process of scaling the platforms, most of the time, they don't take decisions that are related into a consciousness a development of environmental and social issues on the countries that they go. So let's take, for example, everybody's talking about Uber, let's talk again then Uber. So when they go to a new country and they go inside an underdeveloped country like Brazil, and they get their way of uh, developing their business there, they really don't interact with civil society, with government, they don't talk, how can we, it's this very, very powerful technological and very good tool. Uber is an amazing tool, online tool. I use it and it's amazing. But how can we, with this powerful tool, address your problems? And this is called resilience. Nowadays, I think innovation in business is about building Resilience. Resilience is understanding how can I, as an organism, which is a company, companies are organisms, okay? How can I, as an organism, entering a new local environment, very different from where I came from, how can I do the best for you and still come with profit? If I ask this question for different stakeholders, be in civil society, governments, and even other private sectors like taxi industries and stuff, what they do is that they are very aggress aggressive and competitive organisms, which they have now enemies. And this is not sustainability, this is not resilience. And you know what? I believe this is not good business in terms of money, because in the middle or in the long term, it will come a new organism, which is a technology super well done as Uber, but ask these questions and come with intention to change it. So I open up yet the, the thing of how can the collaborative economy address poverty? changing the culture on the way we do business, in the core of the business. So just to open up the thing. So it's not that we have to be poor or beggars, it's just the idea of, uh, let's uh, talk uh, MBA, business models, uh, venture capitalists, uh, coming up uh, with a new innovative way of financing, finding finances. So there is a possibility, and there are brilliant minds sitting in this room, don't you guys believe? So. I think so. And if you guys want to do something, and in we share, I think it's really a possibility. So a human part of it is definitely a center of this. And in the contrary of how we see money, uh, Christina, you were talking earlier about social business, and you see that there is already a lot of people and a big movement out there with social entrepreneurs and social businesses who are doing this, right? So what do you think can be a synergy there with the collaborative economy, and how can they learn from this other movement which is already on, on avalanche? Well, first of all, I think um, both economies, collaborative economy and also social business are relatively new developments. And um, as I mentioned earlier, you, you see some um, collaborative approaches with, uh, with a social mission. And um, I think because it's natural because people are multi-dimensional human beings. Of course, everyone is interested in making money and profit for themselves, but at the same point, we also care about other people. And um, I think it's, it's a matter probably also of your um, personal um, life the, that you went through and have experienced different things that you might be um, more open or more closer to social issues than another person. Um, 
but yeah, as I said, I still think that those initiatives are starting to develop. And to give you one example, um, in, the, in the recent weeks when we saw in Germany a lot of refugees coming from, from Africa, from Syria, from, from Eastern Europe, um, people um, um, and authorities were actually not able to, uh, to compensate all of that demand. Um, citizens started initiatives where they created a platform, it's called Welcome Refugees, where they would match private households um, to host those persons in throughout the process as seeking asylum and helping them with the paperwork, with language things and all of that. So I think this is um, slowly developing and I think we just need to, to connect more. Um, uh, um, and um, I invite everyone here in this room to, um, to come in and join in and, and learn from the social business community. And I think there are so many different ways of how um, collaborative entrepreneurs could um, empower people at the bottom of the pyramid. Of course, you could think of um, either developing products or services for those people, but then you can also think of how you can uh, integrate them into your operations and maybe becoming your suppliers, but also eventually making them co-owners of your business. And um, I would like to share a little experiment that we did um, last summer. We uh, went to a rural village uh, with a very high unemployment rate, like more than 70%. And you will find such a village in the rural areas in any country around the world. And what is happening in these villages is that you have a huge uh, exchange economy. So you have uh, one person producing bread, the other one marmalade, someone's good at knitting, producing clothes, the other one makes products out of wooden, and then the people exchange amongst themselves. Um, since they don't have the access to a bigger market where they could actually sell those products, it's hard for them to sell those items. And we went into the village to um, discover if we would find people that would like to become uh, entrepreneurs and help them in professionalizing their products and, for example, selling them on a digital platform. And um, what, we, what we also find out is that it's not only the access to the market that those people are lacking, but also um, uh, important skills in terms of marketing, branding, packaging. For example, there was this lady producing very delicious marmalade and uh, honey, and then filling the products into used uh, uh, cosmetic boxes or Coca-Cola bottles. And um, nobody would like to buy such a product, even though the marmalade might taste super yummy. So um, we were offering or asking these people whether they would like to be interested in joining our experiment, where would we help them with, uh, with branding and marketing and all of these things and enabling them an access to a bigger market. And that's, I think, what is needed for um, people in the collaborative economy to empower those people to become entrepreneurs and participate in, in their models. So the bigger picture is connect, connect this yeah. here to connect wherever there is a lack of access. So on the term of connect, I don't think there is any better person in this panel to really talk about collaboration and connection because Asma, you're doing both. You are so active in WeShare and the co-chair and I don't know how many initiatives you know. And then the other side you're doing MENA, which is again working with the developing world in North of Africa with uh, European countries. So you might be able to address how this connection is possible then to facilitate this to accelerate. Yes, definitely. Um, uh, I would first like to react on what uh, Christina said. Uh, I have a really good example that, um, of uh, an initiative that was developed in Morocco recently, uh, mixing technology uh, and, uh, and rural tourism. Uh, it's an app called Anu. It was developed by uh, um, an American guy who was working in an NGO in the south of Morocco, in a really rural region like Wardazet, south of Morocco. And we have amazing craftsmen there uh, producing carpets, wood, jewelry, and so on. And indeed, they, they don't have access to the market. And he, it was at the beginning of uh, development of Etsy. So what he did, he developed an app really easy for people who are first uh, user in technology. So mostly in this rural area, people have uh, a phone. It's not a smartphone, but phone that are able to take pictures and to uh, send SMS. So basically, they develop an app like Etsy, uh, looking with profiles for every craftsman. And he worked for two years with one woman and 
one man, local craftsman, that are today CEO of uh, this Anu, and he trained them to take pictures of, um, of the products and sell them. And basically, every time someone would order on the website, mainly in the US, because he's from the US, so the market today is in the US, the um, craftsman would receive a message and then go to the post office and send it. So um, for me, it's a very good example of how we can foster and use digital technology in order to empower local people. And, um, but let's, I just wanted to erect on that. But to go back on the collaborative economy and the collaborative culture, because that's what strike me the most, be comparing, um, for example, the WeShare community in uh, developing countries, France, Europe, and the US. And in the MENA region where it's starting, because uh, we started communities in Morocco, Tunisia, Morocco one year ago, Tunisia um, about two months ago, Lebanon as well last year, and then we're studying also Egypt. Um, it's very interesting because there's a contradiction, and what, what made me told you gray uh, late before, is that here we have a collaborative culture, a collaborative culture emerging. People are looking to build connection and, um, and trust each other to work together. As, as the opposite in Morocco and, uh, uh, and North Africa countries and, uh, uh, and Middle East as well, you have initially a collaborative culture existing. So, I mean, we didn't, we didn't uh, wait to have apps to borrow coffee or sugar from our neighbors. Uh, we have, in Morocco and Tunisia, car sharing, uh, services exist uh, provided by the government for years. I grew up in a uh, cooperative of uh, ho housing cooperative, so it is in our culture, uh, in our society. But when it when it comes to business and to creating and developing projects, we completely lose this trust and this spirit of collaboration. And this is the main issue that many entrepreneurs I've been talking to are facing today: is that other people like them, other entrepreneurs, they just uh, have a hard time to trust um, their, um, their semblable, other people like them, and they don't work uh, together. So this is really the hard, the, all the work that we have to do right now is to build this trust and to create a community. So in Morocco now it has begun, but it's the, it's the challenge today. Um, that's actually, uh, just to add to it, Asma, is you mentioned the digital aspect of what yes. the uh, Anouk, and I just, like I said, I'm a big believer of examples and doing. There are so many examples that I can give, and uh, Tata and Marty at the back uh, doing these beautiful charts. Just go back later on and just look at these examples. The guy today who spoke about the 21 pound, about transition network, is a big example for me where it's a grassroots initiative impacting communities. There's the biggest favela, uh, I think it's a slum, right? Like kind of a slum, kind of a living in Brazil. Um, he's, he started something called Banco Palmas, where again, uh, uh, a collaborative in initiative where uh, the entire currency and entire goods produced stays in the community. And the, the funny Nigerian guy started uh, DMT mobile toilets, uh, also driven by the community and to uh, give access uh, to the poorer parts of uh, uh, Nigeria uh, toilets. So it's not just the di uh, digital context, although although the big elephant in the room, the second big elephant in the room is technology, isn't it? So technology is a big question here, and I think, Tatya, you had a nice presentation prepared for us. So let's try and see if we can get the presentation on the, on the thing and you can uh, guide us through. Sure, uh, yeah, so what happened uh, in Mexico in specific is that uh, we are a developing country. We even have a gover governmental um, institution for um, uh, innovation at the government of Me Mexico City. Uh, the thing is that it's still very centralized, so we need to uh, um, make this gap uh, uh, of accessibility uh, less. Um, so we have two challenges, I think, uh, because we have polarized societies. What happens is that rich people it's getting even richer, and poor people it's getting even poorer. So uh, uh, this gap it's really something we need to to face and to uh, make innovations in this sense. Um, I, I just want to show you a few 
data. This is Latin America, and if you see, Mexico is on the one of the last uh, places. Uh, and for sure, digital devices have changed this uh, landscape. But the thing is that you, when you access to internet, what are you doing with it? You, the main uh, uh, thing is uh, uh, people use internet for social uh, networks, and of course, emails. And this is uh, so far away from all these applications, business, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, huge possibilities that internet have. So the thing is not only making the, the gap uh, lower, but to, uh, um, to make consciousness about what are we doing with internet, right? Um, the other thing that, that I think is important is the ba bankerization of uh, our, our society. I cannot, yeah. There. Uh, so if you see in 2011, uh, from these people that have uh, internet and bank accounts, they will only make trans transactions on 19%. Uh, three years later, they will duplicate. So 42% uh, of the population will do some, uh, buy some, uh, uh, yeah, will buy and will provide. Uh, services online, online services. So uh, uh, still, there is a gap, right? So how, how can, because, and this is not for free, because of course in our, we are lacking of security. We are lack, they are they having experiences of um, not really good uh, of, you know, people would steal your accounts and so that's why people is scared, scared to put their, their credit cards on internet. Um, so yeah, we we need to provide a po more public um, politics around innovation, so we can really push together from the public uh, sphere to the uh, private, and of course from education as well. This is only uh, this is a map of the citizen initiatives in Mexico City. Uh, there are more than uh, 350, uh, including, for sure, sharing economy uh, platforms, uh, but also uh, gender, also uh, human rights. And I think we need to really uh, stay in touch uh, with local initiatives. We need to hear what they want in order to, to provide uh, innovation and, and a, a, a real impact, to have a real impact in our societies. Uh, this is an example. Uh, so Brujula, uh, it's based in Mexico City, and they uh, are a platform where you can propose an action uh, to make a better place, our city. So for instance, they are uh, putting Wi-Fi uh, access in parks and public spaces. Uh, and this is related also with the idea of citizenship. We, we need to have more uh, participant citizens, right? Because uh, apparently in our societies, is you, when you uh, vote, that's all, right? But now people is getting consciousness about you can get, get really get involved in, in deeper uh, solution of, of our local problems. Pestalero is a lending platform, so... Um, we do have crowdfunding platforms uh, in, from lending to donation, to many models. Um, so I think this is a way to how, how um, entrepreneurs can also help. You know, so if, if, if monopoly of internet is it, a problem, maybe we, you can provide some alternative services or alternative solutions to uh, impact, right? Uh, what else? Sorry. <laughs> Barter. We, um, yeah, we were talking about that in our societies, uh, solidarity is it's something from the past and it's um, really, um, we know about this, right? So the digital improve, uh, it's what we are facing now. So uh, ex the exchange of several uh, objects can that, uh, can be useful for different people, we are doing this. Uh, we're also working with designers, with uh, hackers, and government in order to 
uh, to map and to think, uh, to, to have the, these innovations, the, these ideas that we need to work in uh, through this kind of platform, like Codeando. Um, and also, I think uh, another important uh, example is that it, we, we can find it on journalism. Journalism, uh, journalists in Mexico are really in danger because uh, there are many uh, situations that are not really good uh, in terms of politics. So uh, they've been using uh, digital platforms to share stories uh, of missing people, and they are giving information, they're providing information that is valuable and that you wouldn't find on mainstream media. So this is also a way to, to share content, to make consciousness of our challenges. Geografía uh, del Dolor is a, a web doc that um, is working on. Th there are a lot of examples, right? Yeah. There are really things that we can uh, even copy, replicate, and then uh, you know, it's not a big, big challenge that uh, people always complain, technology being the biggest elephant in the room. I don't think so. Half of Africa, sorry, not half. I am um, think all of Africa runs on cell phones and smartphones and India and China. So if you guys want a next billion dollar idea with the uh, two billion uh, population, uh, develop something that's uh, already out there and that you can use. But I think there's also a third thing which I don't want to address because it's already a big topic is culture. Like I said in the very beginning, my mom laughs at me when I say, I'm going to this sharing economy, it's so cool, I'm going to share. You know, she's like, what? You know, she's like, what are you going to do, share? Share what? You know, so it's also the attitude and the culture of sharing that uh, the lower income groups and the developing and the uh, underdeveloped, they already have it embedded in them. But I think another big question is also, there are already available resources, uh, like with the UN and the NGOs, um, the biggest challenge for me I see there is them collaborating because they already have the money, the the people, the resources. How do you, it's an open mic, so whoever likes to answer, how do you think we, we can also gather those big, big names to come together and work together? D does anybody want to? Um, yeah, well, um, the problem with uh, NGOs today is indeed they are very present and active, uh, especially in the in the rural regions, um, and they completely lack this uh, lever of technology. And there are many improvements. And actually, the problem is that we are missing today um, people that are taking really care of this topic among this uh, whole NGO world. And I've been talking with a lot of friends uh, who are researchers in this field, and we need to publish stuff and go really just um, spread the world among these, uh, uh, these uh, organizations. The problem is this organization, if, we, if you talk to big ones, they are addressing it, but it's not really efficient because they, are moves, they move really slow. The, the only lever that I see is to, uh, to go talk to the small cooperatives, and that's why the ANU is a good example of that. Or for example, there is a small uh, NGO in uh, in a poor uh, neighborhood of Casablanca, um, where, uh, you know, the, well, it's a very poor and uh, violent area, uh, like a, a slum. And they started kind of a, um, a space there where you have permaculture, you have also, they are making a fab lab, so uh, they are really working on various uh, uh, teams of the collaborative economy with the local youth there to help them empower concretely and um, make the violence out. So these small initiatives are the solution for me. Yeah, it just came up the idea of an NGO. I don't know if you saw the talk from Alessandra Rufino and Jeremy Heyman. It was an amazing talk. So she was saying about the OurCities.org movement. So it is now a global movement that mobilizes civil society into issues, local issues. So just uh, one example, okay? Urban poverty is one of is super intertwined with the lack of basic infrastructure in the big centers of ur urban centers in Brazil. So, uh, the example of Rio, which is uh, now I'm living for two years now, is an amazing, beautiful city, but we have 40 percent of the population without sanic, uh, basic sanitation. Imagine then 40 percent of the population. So when you gather people around an, a cause. And you, in like what our cities does, they go for one data, which is this, basic sanitation uh, for the people out of that. 
you go there and ask for the population, look, we have this problem. Now that we are coming, there was World uh, Cup uh, uh, very few moments ago, there's coming Olympics. We are investing billions and billions and billions of dollars in new infrastructure on stadiums, Olympic stadiums, for horses to go around and uh, And then we have the population without basic sanitation. So this idea of mobilizing civil society to gather an understanding of the reality of the urban poverty areas, which Brazil is very big uh, issue, you know, is very important. And other issue then on the private sector, sector, which I work a lot, I will give you an example of a B Corp. So it's this uh, B Corp movement, a benefit corporation movement. Uh, in Brazil, there is Geeky. Geeky.com.br is a very now famous platform for online education. What do they do? They is a customized online education. They sell uh, uh, signatures for private school. And each signature they sell for private school, they give one for the public uh, schools. So imagine if any of these new collaborative platforms that are uh, rising and gaining a lot of money and momentum and everything, they thought on an innovation on addressing poverty of their own. Maybe, let's say again, Uber, why don't we train people to drive cars, people from poor areas, and we do a HR training program to include people to start uh, riding their cars, like let's say, I don't know, 1% or 2% of their drivers could be people that comes up from their program. Then you start to build a social tissue, a, a weave of people that are interested, that this company goes forward, and a type of social issue and tissue that gathers a new type of economy. And I truly believe that the private sector, when takes decision in a very conscious way, it can drive a big change. Yeah, it's very true because I can relate to the example. I won't tell you uh, much about it. Uh, two weeks ago, I, I met one of, the, one of the people from the Forbes, Forbes list, the top 10, um, and I was just talking to him for some context. And I was talking to him about social change and uh, whatever. And he was like, yeah, don't give me that excuse about having no money or we don't want to invest. Yes, I want to make my profits, but bring me an idea, bring me a person behind it who's going to execute it through and through and give the convenience to the public in both sides of social impact and also a convenient product or a service, then I will invest. This is coming out of quote and quote from somebody who has shitloads of money and who's ready to invest. So that for me is already confirmation, like you said. I have so many questions, but I don't think I can cover them. But I want to give it to the audience because you are very smart guys. So I'm pretty sure you have really smart questions. So please uh, address if you have any questions uh, towards the panel. And I think we have about 10 minutes. So maybe we can take one or two questions, depending. Maybe answers can be a little short. Yeah? OK, quick. Yeah, a quick, a quick question, quick answers that we keep it moving. Yeah. Don't you guys think that we have the risk of collaborative economy go to the same way that social responsibility went in big corporations that's just a marketing and just bullshit? Yeah, yeah I can. A great point. Yeah, it's a great point and it's a true uh, issue. So I work with this international movement which has a certification on companies to uh, uh, prove to the society that what they are doing is not greenwashing. So there is uh, this questionnaire, businessimpactassessment.org.net, uh, where you have 160 questions you answer as a business, any part of the world, and then you have to prove with documents what you're doing. There is an audition, physical audition, and there is a community audition. Everything that you answered is on the web, transparent, saying the reports on so social issues, environmental issues, transparency, governance, and, and et cetera. And then the society can say, look, you, which is the company X for writing, sharing, or whatever, you do, are not doing what you're saying on the web. So I go there and I denounce, I, I report spam or report, you are not doing what you're saying. So I think with uh, platforms, online platforms, fostering transparency and the people who consume for companies more and more uh, demand transparency and demand good things from those companies, you start to change this issue. I think it's a conversation that you guys have to have with the company. So it also depends on them. Yeah, it's a demand from the consumers as well. Yeah. Demand. Yeah. Maybe one I'll take more. one from the middle and one from the back. Uh, me, um, I take this example about collaborative economy in my city in Le Mans, France. In the popular part, every, uh, nobody knows, uh, did not know sharing economy. For example, blah, blah, car or carpooling or different things. So I think the first step is to recognize these people 
And for example, we I discussed with the local actors of this popular park, and the answer is if you add this uh, traveling economy in this popular park, it's a bomb. Because we have the, uh, in the, as Morocco, we have the culture of sharing, of uh, um, pa um, sharing on different things. But it's very important to have this, for me, the first step, ways a very nice uh, collaborativity, col sharing economy exists um, to after engage the people and this local movement after. So engage the people from all levels, you mean? So all levels from the upper, middle, and lower. Is yeah. So how, how do we engage? Was that your question or was it a comment? Comment, a okay, comment. it was a comment. So, so we Any get question one more from question. The back? Could you please stand up? Hello, um, I'm Pascal. I'm uh, working in the water and sanitation sector. And uh, we have created uh, an organization which is called Water Right Makers. Uh, the objective is to share knowledge about access to water and sanitation. And I have a comment. We have spoken about different organizations, small companies, small NGOs, small scale entrepreneurs, big companies. And I think one of the biggest issues is to know how do we, we close and we destroy these silos. Because in this organization, you have people that are actually implementing different projects. And they have a knowledge that they would be able to share and maybe to accelerate other projects. And I think that's maybe a second objective is to share knowledge and try to break the silos and not talking like I am an NGO, I'm not talking with a company and things like that. And uh, yes, that was just wanted to share that with you. Okay, comment. So this is one question up front here. Okay, so I will say that to be a last that's question. Yeah. And then the speakers will be out. You can happily discuss with them all the evening. Uh, it's more of an opportunity than anything else. Um, I'm Benita. I'm the founder of the People Who Share, the people behind something called Global Sharing Week, um, which takes place from the 7th of June to the 13th. And it's all about enabling millions of people to discover the sharing economy. So it's an opportunity, exactly what we're talking about here, about how the sharing economy, the collaborative economy, can address these questions of poverty and inclusion. You can find out information, get involved at thepeoplewhoshare.com. It's for everybody to access. So 7th to the 13th of June, it's an opportunity for everybody from all communities to access and discover the sharing economy because that's what we need to do, come together and celebrate and enable millions more people to discover this space and benefit from it. Thank you very much. So that's it for questions. Like I said, there'll be a sheet somewhere with all the examples. Maybe we can gather around with the speakers and discuss more examples and see how we can move this move this idea forward. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you, everybody. Give them a big hat. Thank you, my fantastic speakers.